Uh, welcome to the Carol Nash Classic Bike Show, Winter Show. Uh, we're today in the Scooter World Hall, looking at the different scooters and the different clubs that are here on display. Some individual members and some club stands. The first one we're looking at is the Generation Scooter Club, local to uh, Boston and Lincoln. And we've got a number of scooters here, Lambrettas and Vespers. Uh, one in particular is uh, previously owned by a member called Dave Jackson. Dave Jackson was a winner of the Lambretta Club Championship and uh, this is his scooter here. It's kept in a bit of a tribute to him because um, he died recently um, of, of cancer and his friends and family keep his scooter running and we use it for various events to keep Dave's name alive. Um, the Generation Scooter Club um, are a popular scooter club. They attend all the rallies up and down the country. We have uh, about 28 events a year and uh, it, it's a really good family atmosphere. Next up we've got the uh, Veteran Vespa Club. Um, on their stall they've got a couple of very uh, interesting bikes. One of them appeared in the uh, Richard Barnes mod book and it was previously owned by Peter Quay from the Kinks. Uh, the Kinks were obviously a group back in the 60s. The scooters had a high profile in the 60s and we use for not just commuting but um, socialising. Um, this particular bike has been lovingly restored and it's on display here, previously owned by Peter Quaif and that's uh, an SS 180 Vespa. Uh, if you look closely um, some of the photos used in Richard Barnes uh, magazine which was um, endorsed by Pete Townsend of The Who um, are on display here and you can see the bike back in the day from 1960 um, through to its present day here on the stand. A couple of the other bikes that are interesting to look at are the uh, Andre Baudet Vespers. Uh, Andre Baudet, obviously from the name you can tell, was a man who came into England and set up shop in Northampton. He was an original uh, Italian guy. Um, it's funny to say that the sales of scooters weren't actually as popular in the 60s as they were in the 50s. In the 50s the sales were incredibly high and by the 60s sales were petering off. So to keep up sales they came up with different sales gimmicks and what we created was the dealer special and as you can see from the dealer special they would highlight it in a two-tone colour so they would add an extra colour. Usually the scooters would come in a basic white colour and the red and the detailing would be added and this was really to make them stand out and increase sales. Um, Andre Baudet himself was quite a scooter enthusiast, not only did he um, sell them or customise them but he also rode them and one of his famous sales gimmicks was to ride a bike much the same as this grey and blue one you see to the very top of Snowdonia. Um, he carried out various feats throughout his life, uh, did a London to Paris mammoth ride against the clock um, and all different gimmicks just really to raise the profile of the shop and to increase sales. So if we move along from the veteran Vespa Club, we come right up to date with the, the British racing scooters. Um, it seems strange that a 10 inch wheeled vehicle that's probably designed to produce 6, maybe possibly 11 brake horsepower can be tuned to in excess of 35 brake horsepower. The vehicle you see here probably bears very little resemblance to what we would consider a modern motor scooter. But this is a Lambretta. Um, everything about it would be uprated, uprated suspension, uprated brakes, water cooled, um, race tuned and probably producing somewhere in the region of 35 brake horsepower. Um, Lambrettas are very popular in the racing fraternity because of all the things you can do but just recently the uh, small frame Vespers that you can see at the back, the uh, green vehicle, that's a very high powered, high revving, fork tuned um, and the, the Falk tuning is incredibly fast and, and this particular vehicle, number 21, has set some real good speed records and competed throughout the year. If we move along we can see all the different um, modifications that are used. They're, at, they're in different groups, there will be um, group 4s, group 6s, specials and they are very very subtle changes made to the engines and uh, the handling but if you see them out on the track, 
that give most vehicles a run for their money. Very, very rapid, very fast. Um, and it's a, it's, a big, it's a big thing in England, uh, the racing community, and they're a very close-knit family. They all look after each other. Um, and it's worth trying to get along to one of the race meetings and see these scooters perform. If we move along now, we move along to um, a club stand that's uh, got a real sentiment in my own heart, being a member of the Lambretta Club of Great Britain. The Lambretta Club of Great Britain have um, a really nice display here today because they're lucky enough to have virtually every model running in a timeline from 1947 right the way through to about 1972-73 when the factory in Italy closed down. And you can see, just looking at the progression, what started out as a utility vehicle used to just go down the shops, pick up a loaf of bread, um, became very popular with ladies because of the step through design, um, easy to ride, low horsepower, high miles to the gallon, easy to ride and easy maintenance. Um, as they became more popular, they were improved, the leg shields got longer, the foot protection got more, and the bodywork was becoming fully enclosed. The more it became enclosed, the, um, the more styling that could be added. But also at the same time, the competition between Lambrettas and Vespers was increasing, and to do so, they would, um, they would race them. So the Italians have always been one for speed, and this particular model is a fine example of a 1951 Model D racer. Um, to the basic eye, it doesn't look much different to the previous models. You look closely at the extra fuel tank, modified carburetors, um, slightly uprated brakes, slightly uprated suspension. Something like that today, because of its age being 1951, because of the fact that there are a very limited amount made, um, you know, you could name your price. Some, something like that, brand new, probably cost less than £100 nowadays. Eight, nine, ten, eleven thousand um, pounds. The price of them just goes up and up and up. We look what we see as a traditional scooter. This is the uh, LD, and already we see that the panel work and the engine and all that is fully enclosed, and it looks more like a traditional scooter that we know today. Um, and this was really the making of the factory. This is this is when Lambrettas started to become into their own. You could uh, add numerous accessories numerous back racks, fly screens, anything you wanted to bolt onto them was available from different Italian made companies. If we cast our eye over to the beginning of the next row we can see the green scooter which would be a 1958-59 series one. If we go to the front of it we can see quite clearly um, the original headlight design, the headlight down on what we would call the leg shields or the front apron um, the Series 1 was a great scooter, but as lighting laws and um, the use of scooters increased, it was, uh, it was noted that it would be better to move the headlight up to the handlebars and headset, which would uh, help with the rider's illumination of the road, etc. So the Series 2, which we see here, the red and white vehicle, that's a 1960s vehicle. Um, and all similar in body and style in the headlight position, uh, has changed considerably. Um, this is what we call a wide bodied scooter. You can see just from the general stance of the vehicle, it's a big robust vehicle, strong, very nice to drive, very, very strong. Even after all the years, you know, 1960s, they, they, they really are. The next vehicle we see, an LI125, LI being the basic uh, branding, less detailing, less chrome work. Um, and these sold in the millions, absolutely flew out the factory. And these are what we call the Slim Style. The Slim Style progressed on, and then we move along and we see what would be called probably the best that the Italians made at one time, the TV175, because of licensing laws, taxation laws. The 175 was about as big as the Italians wanted to go. They didn't really want to make CCs any bigger than that because of their tax laws. Um, Again, because sales were starting to peter off and the mod fashion, etc., accessories were the, were the norm. People started bolting things on and that helped sales. And it also increased your sales. You could put, HP, HP would put, allow you to buy a vehicle very cheaply, small deposit, and then you could add things as, uh, as your pocket allowed. So 
accessories became the order of the day. As we moved into the later 60s, the British market started looking at speed and reliability and, com and competing. So it was the British market completely that pushed for the Italians to increase the CC from 175 up to 200. And this is an SX200, a very desirable vehicle. Um, again, to the untrained eye, you wouldn't notice the subtle differences, but the what's called yellow okra, or we'd, we'd even look at it as an English mustard coloured, was never really available for the SX200. And the SX200 that we see here uh, was purchased from Sicily off of a dealer out there. Uh, the owner who lives in Nottingham flew out to Sicily just to find this vehicle because he'd heard that there was only ever five of this particular model ever made in that colour. Um, so it's a very rare find. 200cc then became the norm, the British market demanded it, they wanted to go faster, they wanted to compete with vehicles in the modern day. So this is probably the last of the production line um, from the Lambretta factory. We, we commonly refer to it as the Lambretta GP200. The Italians refer to it as a DL. Um, very, very nice bike, but as it happened, the, the world was going over to four wheels and the Milan factory that built the Lambrettas started production of the Mini Innocenti car. Um, with the Italian job film, etc., the Mini became very popular. And what happened is the Italian factory sold off all the presses and moved all the production over to India where they carried on making the Indian Lambretta using the Italian presses. Um, alas, the uh, tie-up with Innocenti and Mini petered out as the popularity of the Mini became less and um, the Milan factory closed. So the Lambretta is sort of based in history. We have a small Vega model, which was one of the last ditched efforts to move Lambretta out of the um, old, old styling and into a space-age design. Um, nice little bike but never really caught on, sort of was a case of missing the boat really after it then. Then we have what's um, probably one of the finest paint jobs, um, downtown customings, synonymous with customisation of the uh, late 70s, early 80s and this machine's got some really serious trick bits to it, you know, uprated suspension, uprated tyres, incredible paint job um, and one of the um, one of the latest five-speed five speed gearboxes. At the end we have a fella from a uh, local fella from Lincoln, Cobby. Um, he's what we call a road-going scooterist. He rides all over the country, does thousands and thousands of miles a year, clocks up the miles and still maintains his bike in a high standard. At the end we have a novelty in some ways, Lambretta's tie-up with the Spanish factory Saveta, where they made Lambretta's out in Spain and this is a really for the home market, a moped made for the, uh, the kids of Spain. And these are some of the individual club members from the local scooter community, put their machines on display. There's a wide selection of Vespers, uh, Motor Rimini's and uh, Lambrettas. Some of the people that are display are displaying for the first time, just purely for their own pleasure. Uh, and other people are serious customisers who enter their bike in quite a lot of different custom shows. And we just cast an eye across them and see the quality of workmanship and uh, how much interest they're raising. One of the vehicles in particular, this uh, Moto Rumini, um, very, very, very classic vehicle, extremely smooth to ride, beautiful engine work, unusual styling, very rare, um, very few left in uh, circulation. One of the tricks to sell these vehicles is they would place what was uh, the old Frutney bit coin on the engine casing whilst the engine was running and rev it up and the coin would not move. They are that smooth. Absolute pleasure to ride and this is a really cool restoration work. Um, the Lambretta here, lots of tin work, lots of brightness. Really good, clean, private dealers. You know, like a lot of uh, classic machines. A lot of this is about rebuilding them, finding them as an old barn, fine, rusty old heap, turning them into something really pretty. Here we've got um, one of the most popular custom scooters at the moment, who's picked up prize for best custom scooter. Um, it's a Lambretta TV 175 Series 2. Little odd things about it is what's called the winter model, so it's got the unusual turning front mudguard, um, different to the fat mudguard that we've seen on the previous Lambretta stand. But the paintwork and the, the finishing detail is just synonymous. 
Um, the owner actually lives out on the Isle of Man, so it's um, it's really a case of building bridges with classic bike and bike racers, along with the scooter world. A really nice classic bike, really good example. At the back, we've got some more uh, some more examples of. Uh, Really good ridden scooters, not just customised scooters, but scooters that are ridden all over the country, but still kept into a very, very high show standard. And uh, it's a credit to all the owners that do this, out every weekend. A sort of uh, boys club, really, in a lot of ways. The 100 mile an hour Lambretta scooter club, the racing scooters. Um, all these bikes have set speeds in excess of 100 mile an hour. Um, they regularly compete on the sprinting circuit and the classic bike circuit and uh, it is a uh, it's something to behold to watch some of these vehicles and the speeds they can achieve the vehicle we see at the front the uh, the sprinter um, this has been owned by Keith Terry for a number of years and has gone through a number of different uh, guises over the year originally it was called the Kurzel flyer because uh, Ter Terry's a bit of a South End boy but if we look at the uh, the plaque on here for the straight line of sprinting, on the 15th of August 2009, this vehicle achieved a, uh, a speed of 132 miles per hour. I'll repeat that for a 10-inch Lambretta scooter, 132 miles an hour. There's not many people who would want to do that speed on this sort of vehicle. But everything about them is uh, top-notch, highly tuned, and the knowledge that these guys have, uh, have gained over the years of just trial and error, trial and error, and uh, they, they really are open to share all the information. There, there's no hidden secrets. There's no. There's a, a, a real good camaraderie, rivalry, but really good camaraderie. And they all help each other out. And if you get a chance to go down and see one of these sprints or see one of these race meetings, by all means, get down there. It's amazing to see what scooters can do. Uh, we're here at the Vintage Motor Scooter Stand. Uh, the Vintage Motor Scooter Stand is very uh, old school. The, the guys in this are not just one maker scooter, they cover every maker scooter possible. They've got like a real, I don't know, a good interest in the old fashioned British scooters and the different examples. And, and they've got a real good social calendar. Um, the age bracket of the members is slightly older and the knowledge is phenomenal. There, there's not a lot about scooters these guys don't know. If we cast our eye on some of the machines, um, these guys have a really good rally calendar and a really good social calendar and they've got so many varied machines come along. Uh, some of them probably only had less than 100 vehicles made, some of the old British scooters. Um, there's a big display and show on through one of their members at Coventry at the moment, at the Coventry Motor Museum, and he's actually got on display every single model of British scooters ever made. Well, that's pretty much what it's like here in the uh, Lambretta and Vespa and scooter world here in the club hall at the classic uh, bike show. I don't think um, we've ever been invited here before. The scooters and the motorcycle world have, have run different routes, but this has done a lot to build bridges between the classic bike organisations and the classic scooter organisations. Uh, and long may it succeed. I mean, I hope that next year we'll be back bigger and better than usual. And I hope that it's gone a long way to show people there is a lot to scooter in and there's a lot to offer and I think we could get along really well together. So if you've missed out, come along next year or watch this video and realise what you've missed.